Hey, John, welcome to Good Movie Monday. How are you? Good. Thanks for having me. No, it's my pleasure, mate. Look, this film is um, it's a really striking film and highly entertaining. Um, I want to start with the obligatory question or, you know, can you describe this to our listeners? What is this film about? Those that have never heard of it, what are they? What can they expect? Absolutely. I can say, I always think of an, uh, the survivalist as a post uh, a post apocalyptic western. That's kind of the pitch that I always get. But basically it's about it takes place a year and a half after the a covid variant has wiped out about 90% of the population. Civilization has collapsed. Marauders run the countryside and such. And so the movie's about Jonathan Reese Myers, a former FBI agent who is living on his family's uh, hereditary ranch. Um, you know, ridden by guilt because his father died. He felt like he couldn't protect him. And so he's a he's a survivalist, you know. And what we've got is a group of marauders led by John Malkovich, who are hunting a woman that is supposedly immune to the virus. And the their idea is if they capture the woman, they can breed a new population that's immune to the virus. She ends up at the ranch, the Marauders end up at the ranch, and we have the classic Western standoff between John Jonathan Reese Myers and John Malkovich. Fantastic stuff. There's so many like classic tropes in there that just sort of adapt really well to this new kind of environment, which I really loved. Um, so how long did this how how long's the film been around for? Have you been on board with it from the get-go? I, I was. So so funny enough, we were this is November just before the pandemic actually became a thing. Um, so I guess that's November 2019. And we, the producers that I work with, they they had contacted me and they were like, hey, listen, we need you to put together an action movie. What can you do? And a writer that I'm good friends with, Matthew Rogers, um, Matthew and I were actually together on a movie set in Syracuse, New York. And so I started talking to Matthew about it. And Matthew's like, well, let me come up with an idea. And so while we were working, producing this other movie, Matthew came up with the idea for The Survivalist. No idea about COVID. It wasn't a thing yet. You know, we're only like two months away. And he wrote the first draft of the script. He and I, I he and I developed the story together. And then he wrote the first draft of the script. And that first draft was done right about the same time that COVID sort of took the spotlight in the world. And so, yeah, so it's it's only been around since November 2019. And of course, once COVID hit, you know, that spring, everything shut down. Um, and the original version of the script wasn't specifically COVID. It was a non-described, you know, pandemic. Um, but by the time things opened up enough for us to start filming again here in the States, um, we decided to take it, to change it to COVID. And the funny thing is, is at that point, we we decided well let's go with a variance you know several variants further out so that it's yeah. not you know so we came up with covid delta and it just happened that at least here <laughs> in america it came out just as covid delta became a thing in the us also <laughs> Well, I mean, there's no better way to connect the film with the audience than to scare the shit out of them with a bit of reality. <laughs> exactly. And I hadn't even thought about it. I was actually doing the audio commentary for the Blu-ray um, just a couple of months before it came out. And as I was as as I was talking on the commentary, it suddenly occurred to me, oh, my God, we're talking about Delta and Delta is a thing right now. Yep. Oh, my goodness. Um, what struck me probably most about the production was the production value. Like you've made really good use of locations and the whole tone of the story. I'm guessing the script dictated the tone. But did you draw upon any influences from other films or anything to sort of create the look of the film? Not, not specifically. I mean, definitely Westerns were a thing. I mean, yeah. we, we referenced a lot of classic Westerns, John Wayne, you know, Rio Bravo, you know, things like that. We referenced uh, 310 to Yuma um, and some movies like that. Um, Austin, Austin, who's my director of photography, we, we started working on it together very early, um, coming up with a look of the film where we wanted to keep, we wanted to have some of the grunginess of a post-apocalyptic film, but also having some of the style of a Western film. And so we were looking to kind of create those. And Kaylee Masson, the production designer, he and I have known to work together for a long time. And so we we kind of embraced all of that. And Kaylee was the one who found this ranch, found this location. 
And I mean, when we showed up, he called me, he had, we were running out of ideas. We were running out of spots that we all really liked. And at this last minute, he get a, he got a call. It was like, Hey, turn North, drive a mile and a half. We're waiting for you to check out this place. We just found out about it. And it was an old horse ranch that was in the middle. It had just been sold. It had just been bought. And so it was just empty. And we showed up there and particularly you've seen the movie, it doesn't give anything away, but there's a big, you know, in, in the house and then all of the barns, there's a big open space in between all of that, a big courtyard. And we affectionately nicknamed it the OK Corral. And, uh -huh. you know, so there were so many things about that location that we just embraced that helped to, you know, elevate that Western vibe to the movie. Oh, absolutely. And, and done so bloody well, if I might say. Uh, and let's, we can't talk about this film without talking about the amazing cast. Can you discuss the process of securing such big leads for the film? Like you've got Jonathan Rhys Myers, John Malkovich, and then in support, you've got Julian Sands. It's a huge trifecta. How did, oh. how did, how did you get all those? So, so funny enough, so in the August, we, we shot, I directed a movie called Rogue Hostage about four months before The Survivalist. And John Malkovich happened to be one of the stars of that. John and I clicked, we became very good friends. And as it sort of ended, he, he called me up and he said, listen, if you got another movie, I'd love to do another movie with you. So as Survivalist came around, I called John and I was like, hey, John, here's, a new, here's another script. Would you give it a read? And, and John read it and called me back immediately. and was like, we've got to do this. Yeah. So that's how John got on. Then Jonathan Reese Myers, we knew his manager uh, pretty well, and we had discussed a lot of different names for his, for his role and just decided, yeah, let's go after Jonathan. And, and Jonathan read the script. He responded really well. He was, you know, happy to jump on board. Julian was really funny was, so John Malkovich and Julian Sands are old friends all the way back to the killing fields, whatever that is, 30 years ago or something. Mm -hmm. And John called me up one day and was like, hey, have you cast, you know, Ben's father yet? Um, Jonathan's father. And I said, no. And he's like, listen, I talked to Julian. Julian would love to work with you. I just spoke so highly of you and Julian would love the role. So we ran it by the producers and the producers thought it was a great idea. The funny thing is, as we found out, so so uh, Julian had starred, I think it was in a Michael Winterbottom movie many years ago. And Jonathan Reese Myers had been hired to play the younger self of Julian Sands. And so, because they looked so much alike. So playing them as father and son was perfect, but they never actually met on that movie set. So, yeah. you know, whatever it was, 15 years later, they both showed up on set for The Survivalist, um, you know, and got to do it. And then we got Lori Petty also to do the voice of the radio operator, which which I, I wanted a very distinctive voice for the radio operator since we never see her. I had her in my head, didn't think we could get her, but I caught, but her man, her agent is a friend. And so I rattled off this, these other names, knowing that it was a client. It was like, you know, anybody like this? And he's like, well, what about Lori Petty? And I'm like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, and so we got Lori. Lori was amazing. She did such a great job just doing that voice throughout the movie. That's fantastic. You know, I can't think of a better father son pairing in movie, you know, in the last 10 years at least. Like, it's so perfect, those two, as father and son. As I'm watching, I'm like, this is just made to be, you know, absolutely. Oh, is it, you know, it, you know, the more I found out about their own history, obviously, where they've been cast as, you know, yeah. the, themselves, it's, it's, but they clicked so well on set. And, you know, we spent a lot of time working together. Because, I mean, I mean, obviously, like, a lot of the really big emotional dramatic moments of the movie are really between Jonathan and, and Julian and the two of them just embraced it and just nailed it. I mean, I watch, I still watch, I mean, I, you know, with the edit and everything, I think I've seen the movie like 300 times, but I still watch their scenes together and I get completely enthralled by their performances and what they're doing as father and son. Absolutely. And, you know, we have these preconceived notions of certain actors in our heads, and I've always thought that John Malkovich would be one of those sort of difficult or, you know, hard people to work with. But you make it sound like it was a piece of cake. Oh, John, John Malkovich is one of the most enjoyable actors I've ever worked with. He is truly a distinguished gentleman. And I mean, obviously, I mean, he's a legend. He's a pro. And so as a director, you want to get out of his way. You want to let him bring everything to the table that is John. And so, and because John and I already had a shorthand from the previous movie, 
this made it made the survivalist an even more enjoyable experience working together because we had that shorthand and I knew what he was going to expect. He knew what he was going to get from me. Um, and so it, it, we mesh really well. We're, we, we've become really good friends and he's just so gracious and giving to the cast and to the crew. And he's a joy to be around with. And I even produced another movie since then that John is in also. Oh, awesome. Uh, what's that one called? That one's called White Elephant. Awesome. I'll and, look out for that one. Yeah. And yeah, it comes out in a couple of months, I think. Brilliant. Um, what I loved about his character in this film is there's a lot of ambiguity there because, you know, he's the villain, but he's not a villain. Like, his, his motive is, you know, good. And yet it shows what happens to men when, you know, you've got a good intention, but, you know, and there's a bigger game at play. You know, Absolutely. He really, he really had that, that ambiguous sort of nature down pat. Well, that's one of the things that, thank you for saying that, because that's one of the things that John and I spent a lot of time talking about, because even when Matthew was writing the script, I mean, there's the old adage that a bad guy never knows that they're a bad guy. And so we never wanted the, you know, the mustache twirling villain <laughs> out of that, out of that role. And, you know, it's, it's interesting to us because there's even the dynamic. So Jenna Lee Green from Sabrina, the Teenage Witch, she plays Marley, the counterpart with John Malkovich. And we even kind of structured the idea that John is a fanatic, but Marley's a zealot. And so the two of them got to play that dynamic as well. And it really makes John not a villain. I mean, we, he really believes what he believes and he believes he's doing a greater service for the world, you know, yeah. of what's going to happen. It just happens that you're trying to kidnap a woman and breed her. <laughs> <laughs> oh, That's dude. not a good thing. <laughs> no. um, yeah, there's so much in this film for people to sort of you know, get stuck into. It's fantastic. But if I can take you right back for a moment, I'd like to sort of know a little bit about your story. You've literally made dozens of films. You know, you've been working in the, industry for over 20 years is filmmaking all you've known like you know is this you know have you it's lived and breathed it since you're a kid no it's funny is i grew up i grew up wanting to be a writer and not even specifically green uh, screenwriter i thought novelist or something like that but i wanted to be a writer my whole life and i even eventually became an entertainment journalist so i was 28 29 i wrote a screenplay thinking that i would sell it mm -hmm. and never had any intentions of being a director being a producer or anything like that and a friend of mine said, you know, you should just go make this movie yourself. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, that's an interesting idea. Sure, why not? And it was called American Nightmare. And it came out, it was a big hit, but I, it, it, I absolutely fell in love with filmmaking. Absolutely fell in love. So, so it's, you know, for the last, I guess it's been 22 years now, I live and breathe movies, you know, writing, directing, producing. But no, I never intended to be a filmmaker. It came, you know, late in life, so to speak. Oh, that you know, gives hope to those of us that, you know, that are <laughs> entertainment writers you know, who write scripts at the same time. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. And I tell everybody, I mean, I speak at, you know, I get invited to speak at conventions and, and universities and stuff like that. And I tell everybody, you know, you never know what your, your next dream might be, but if you've got a dream right now, embrace it, grab it, never let it go. And, you know, follow the course of, you know, follow your whim, whatever makes you happy. <laughs> Amazing. Great advice. Um, and look, it's been really amazing chatting with you. Um, the film is fantastic. Everyone should get out and watch it. And it is available on DVD and uh, video on demand, thanks to Eagle Entertainment here in Australia. Um, we've got copies to give away, so keep your eyes on our website. And um, John, it's been such a pleasure, mate. Thank you for the chat. No, you're welcome. Enjoy. I enjoyed it. Thanks a lot, Glenn. It is day 592 since the beginning of the end. There's no more government here. For those survivors who are still with us, batten down the hatches, make sure your guns are clean and find a way to protect yourself. You need to run. Don't stop until you get to base. Go! You need to get to base. He was one of the best FBI agents I've ever seen. He became a survivalist. Why did you come here? Take the girl. We're gonna kill the rancher. You have 30 seconds to get off my property. You can A, give us the girl, then let me burn your ranch to the ground. Or B, we will kill you and take the girl anyway. Don't let them take me. It's gonna be a long night. 
I'm the one who decides who lives and dies. Me. You come to my house! You try to kidnap this girl! And then you try to kill me! There's five of us. There's one of him. I didn't ask you to come here! The girl is mine. She is my destiny. Your destiny is gonna get you killed.